I'm Ned Quant. I'm president and CEO of the Colorado Trust. Thank you for joining us today. This is our first health equity learning series event for the 2016-2017 season. And we're really pleased with those of you who've turned out. You know, in 1990, Colorado's, uh, the share of Colorado's population that was immigrant was 4.3%. And when we last looked in 2013, it had risen to nearly 10%. We're home now to more than half a million, uh, half, I'm sorry, five, sorry, we're home now to more than half a million immigrants, which uh, is about the same population as the entire state of Wyoming and fill, would fill many of our major cities in the US. How immigrants are integrated into communities in Colorado and in other settings and how they can do that in a safe, healthy, and equitable manner is at the heart of today's session. In, in addition to the presentation and the discussion, there are written materials uh, at your places uh, that can help you continue the conversation as you leave today to your other organizations. We're also gonna send each of you an evaluation via email. We hope you'll take uh, the time to fill it out. We listen to you. We respond to you, both uh, the topics and the speakers uh, that we consider for the Health Equity Learning Series uh, come from uh, our audience as well as our grantees. The materials will be posted on our website after the presentation. Uh, our presenter slide deck will be there. And in about a couple of weeks, a complete video of the presentation uh, will also be available for, um, for uh, viewing. I need to acknowledge that even though we have lots of people in the room, there are lots of other folks. Uh, these are our 2016-2017 HELS grantees. Uh, they're scattered across the state. And um, the difference in this year is that after today's presentation and when the video is available, uh, these events, these uh, grantees will have events where they view and, and look at the presentation followed by professionally facilitated discussions about what they've heard today and how to make it come alive in their community. So we're looking forward to really continuing this work throughout Colorado. Now I want to introduce our speaker today. Deliana Garcia, or Del, is director of the International Projects Research and Development at the Migrant Clinicians Network in Austin, Texas. Della has dedicated more than 25 years of her life and career to the health and wellness needs of migrant and other underserved populations. She's responsible for the development and expansion of Health Network, an international bridge, case management, and patient navigation system to make available across international borders the health records of migrants diagnosed with infections and chronic diseases. She's performed research and written on topics such as sexual and intimate partner violence prevention among Latino migrant and immigrant families, trauma in transit for migrant crossing international borders, and emotionally charged dialogues between patients and healthcare providers. I hope you'll all join me in wel welcoming uh, Dell to our stage and to Colorado. recall the days when I would be able to do this without my reading glasses, but those are long gone now, so please forgive me if I stop every now and again to pull my glasses up to make sure that I haven't missed a point um, on my notes. When I was invited to come, and I'm so thrilled and so grateful for the opportunity to be with you, and I was trying to think about what was the critical issue that I wanted to raise with you, it was that I feel like we find ourselves needing to identify that point in that sphere of health equity where we want to be doing our work. Because it's just such an enormous idea to just wrap your head around. And so what I want to speak to is the intersection of poverty, migration, and health. Because when you think about migration, it is huge the world over. But it can happen for people who are doing so under wonderful economic circumstances and where their health care is really seen to by their employer or by nationalized medicine whatever. And so what I really want to do is focus down then on those populations who migrate for purposes of employment where there's poverty that is really pushing them and keeping them from being able to access what they need and then the effect of that migration on health. 
But when I reflect, and I really need to upgrade my bio because it's been 30 years, um, I, I was trying to think about what best exemplified my own work and where I saw myself. And while I was sitting there reviewing my slides, this passage came to mind. Would you tell me, please, which way I ought to go from here? That depends a good deal on where you want to get to, said the cat. I don't much care where, said Alice, so long as I get somewhere. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, if you only walk long enough. And I think what's really true for so many of us, and I have a dear friend who uses this expression, we've been laboring in the vineyards of peace for so long that very often we realize that we walk back around and see our footsteps again someplace where we've been before. And so I think it's always very important for us to position ourselves, to sight where we're going, and to see that point on the horizon that we're trying to get to. So for me right now then, it is to really talk about the impact of migration on health. And as I was preparing for this presentation, and I was really trying to rev you know, review the most current literature on health equity, everywhere I read began with the, the quotation about, Health equity is the highest level of health for all people. And I thought, well, really, how lofty, how wonderful, and in so many ways, how amorphous. How do we determine that we've gotten there? And the more I read, the more that I could see in people's language that they were conflating equality with equity. And equality is, is treating everyone the same. So we have performance measures that everybody needs to, to meet, and goals for entry into care, and you know, measures for their diabetes that we want to make sure everybody achieves. And so we look at how people should be dealt with, and we want to make sure that it is happening for everyone. But when we talk about equity, it's really looking at what the individual needs to be successful. And very often, that's different one person from another. So one of the definitions of health equity that I came upon as I was reviewing everything was this, absence of avoidable or remediable differences. And the more I pondered it, while there are truly very few things that are unavoidable, perhaps you know, nature, um, a flood, whatever, those things may not be avoidable, there really isn't any reason that our recovery from that is unremediable. There, are, there wasn't anything that I could think of at that moment where we really could not have come to a way of remediating the effects of what had occurred. And so when I think about health equity then, I was trying to look at all of the elements that come into play. And when we think about what affects health, and we look at things like employment, which is one of the pieces that I focus on because it is for employment that so many of the people with whom I work leave their home and move on to the next place. But then I think about racism, and I think about how difficult it is for us to truly have a conversation about race, the effects of racism, and the long-term effect in this country on poverty that is based on the racism that has existed um, for decades. And that that same effect then can be seen in education, both in terms of access and quality. And that it is individual decisions that get made about whether or not my child should have the education that they merit and that they need versus what I see is going to be important for my entire community. And I had the good fortune of being at dinner with members of the trust uh, board last night and some of the staff and some of the grantees. And this has raised a particularly important issue for me. I have a son who's now 27, and he has Asperger's. And I was so firmly committed to public education that I absolutely required that he attend public school, from kindergarten all the way up to high school, through the senior year in high school. And on evaluation, I have moments quietly at night when I believe that I sacrificed my son on the altar of public education. Because when I look at what he needed and what might have better served him, would he have thrived more in a private setting? And I don't truly know that. And so I do have moments of extreme quiet where I wonder if I would redo the same thing. And yet, if asked about education, my commitment to public education, 
to the demand of the citizenry to support education for all children is still true. And so it is at this point that I really understand what is a challenge for so many people when they try and look at it in the global or the universal or the large scale versus the individual and the personal. And I think we see some of those same things in healthcare. When we say, don't you believe people should have access to quality health care, in general, people will say absolutely. And when you say that it might have some effect on your particular access, then I think some people stop and they stumble and they're unable to embrace it completely. And we see it now in issues of public safety and in terms of do we see the, the police force as an ally or do we see them as a challenge? And the experience that so many communities are having now to try and figure out what the relationship is going to be around issues of public safety. And then food access. And food access is one of the pieces that I think is such an enormous challenge, both urban and rural. Um, and, and so that you know, it isn't just, is there the grocery store, but do they have what you need? Is it affordable? What does it take to get there and get back? Um, an advancement of ideas like you know, the community action for agriculture and everything that has the ability to affect food access is really fairly enormous. Um, and one of the pieces that I like to review regularly because he is such a wonderful speaker and he makes me think so differently about food access is the TED Talk done by Ron Finley. And he's the gorilla gardener, yes, the gorilla gardener from LA. And he went out and he evaluated how much public land what there was in LA that was unused and tried to talk about the amount of gardening that could be done on these public lands and the food that would then be available. And he started by using the easements in front of his house and his front yard and areas in his neighborhood that were you know, between lanes and he planted food that he made available to everybody and then the city of Los Angeles decided that they would ticket him because he was using the land for, for purposes that were not subscribed to by the city of Los Angeles. And it was only through public outcry and Lopez, I, do, I can't remember what his first name is, who's the, the writer for the LA Times, that they were finally able to turn the corner on that. And so you have people who create wonderful solutions. It really doesn't require an enormous dollar investment. They can bring people in to learn, to give them access, and then there are political challenges and legal challenges that can get raised that don't make any difference, that then draw away time and attention that could be devoted elsewhere to try and fight that good fight. And so I, I really commend to you Ron Finley. I just think he's a, a, wonderful, a wonderful speaker and a wonderful community advocate. And so when we think about equity then, in looking at the unequal distribution to and, and access to these resources, and where I stop, and I have to think about my own work, is in the second piece of this, which is failure to avoid or overcome the inequalities that infringe on fairness. And that, once again, puts the onus on the individual who is challenged by those barriers, you know, by those inequalities, as if somehow they had the opportunity to supersede these barriers and were electing not to. And so I looked at this more as my inability to help someone over, avoid or overcome those infringements. And I see that as my challenge going forward, that where I see an infringement, do I have the ability to aid someone as an ally so that they no longer have to look at trying to get past that infringement um, to fairness? And the unfortunate reality is this is where most of us get stuck in our arguments. If we work with small not-for-profit organizations or if we work in state government, if we work anywhere, how many of you have been engaged in a conversation of we need to do more with less? Or we need to make sure we get the biggest bang for our buck? Or we need to understand that this is three years and in three years the whole project's going to go away so everyone who started needs to think about the fact that they're likely going to lose their job in three years. But in, for the next three years they're going to give it a go, hit the gas and do incredible work. And what does that require for someone mentally to understand that this is the quadrant in which most of the decisions are being made around their work and their action. And I, I always wonder how people are able to move forward 
And I have as an example uh, from my youth. I grew up in El Paso, Texas. And, um, and was, there's a convent there. And I, I was sent to school there by my mother for reasons that we won't go into now. But uh, it was a really beautiful place, and I received a wonderful education. And when it was built at the turn of the last century, the woman who was the head of the convent was named Mother Praxides. And she wanted to have a convent, a chapel, a theater, and a full school. And they kept trying to say, Mother Praxides, there isn't enough money. And her response then was, God will provide. And so they built the school, and they built the convent, and then they ran out of money, and so she built half of the chapel and said, well, the city hasn't provided us with what we need. And the embarrassment to the community was such that the money was immediately raised. And then Mother Praxedes was able to say, God provided. <laughs> so how we choose to raise what we need and take the action that we do at times may be uncomfortable and certainly make people feel um, that they've been sort of highlighted and, and marginalized and narrowed for their position. But very often, it does take a willingness to step forward in the spotlight in a way that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, and so it, that's the case, is that in rare instances, can we go it alone? That it really does look, require that we look to our allies, that we look to our partners to really be successful in what we're doing. But it also means that we need to be clear about our own work because very often we're moving so hard and so fast and we're so grateful for any recognition or we're so grateful for any kind of funding and we really feel like we're on the road and then suddenly we get to that block where we have a funder who says, I absolutely want to support what you're doing, but I'd like for you to double the numbers of people that you're going to reach and I need for you to split the money with these six other groups. And then you have to stop. And so I think many people have had that experience. And I think of a wonderful group that I, that I work with out of Oakland, where they've been looking um, you know, at, at incarceration and kids. And they wanted 10 years ago to be thought leaders. And they really pushed the work. And they really got into community. And they did some great stuff. And then they started to receive recognition. And then they started to receive funding. And then they were being invited to all of those conversations where they'd not been invited before to be able to set the agenda. And then when they got there, they realized that the money was tied to working with individuals and organizations that did not share their commitment to community, that didn't hold the same vision, and that felt a good outcome was a series of meetings to discuss our issues. And that left them stopped and having to come back in and reconsider how they wanted to work organizationally. So I think that that's one of the pieces, is, it's, is that we need to understand what our position is going to be. We have to come back and reevaluate it. We really do need to look across the horizon to individuals that are going to be allies. It needs to be OK to say, this is not someone with whom I can ally, because we do not share the same decisions of how we want to move forward in community. It doesn't mean that we need to tear one another down, but it doesn't mean, mean that we need to tie ourselves into an ungraceful three-legged race with a group that really does not support our work, merely because we feel like somehow we lose potency for our position when we say, no, thank you. And I, I would encourage you all to look at a group out of Florida. It's the Immokalee's workers. And they're the individuals that pushed for the penny a pound extra for tomatoes. And they really, they held out against farmers in Florida and they were able eventually to successfully get, rally for an extra penny a pound. And what that really meant for the pay of the farm workers that they represented was really enormous. But what the Immokalee workers have decided is that they will not take any money from a foundation or an organization. They don't take it from the federal government because they feel that they are an organization of the workers and the workers need to decide the work to be done. And that if they take money, then it comes with a requirement that you see through to the end whatever the donor would like for you to do. And I think that that's a really interesting challenge because they've been incredibly successful in Florida without the kind of support that we often believe is essential. So I would recommend that you give them a look. 
And I think the other piece that's also really critical when we look at the areas that we engage in because they somehow advance equity, like law reform or economic capacity or social relationships, that they, they, when we are really steeped in trying to look at those reforms or trying to push the advancement of someone's economic capacity or develop those strong relationships, that what can also happen is that we get seduced by that work. And then, you know, the law reform really becomes position power. And economic capacity really becomes the wealth of the organization or the organizations with whom we've worked. And their ability to stay the course, to, to be true to the mission, gets challenged. Because who wants to have their funding threatened? And then when you start to have connections with individuals, it is no longer that you have this wonderful frame for allies, but that then you have prestige. And how do you turn loose of that prestige? And so each element can have two sides to that same coin. And it's very difficult not to be drawn, and this is my expression, to the dark side when you're really trying to advance all of your good work. And so, because I'm not above dropping names, I want to say that my good fortune has included working with folks like Paul Farmer. Um, and I was really fortunate to meet the people at Partners in Health, including Paul and Jim Kim, who's now the president of the World Bank, and Ophelia Dahl, who were the founders, at a time when they were really trying to get Partners in Health moving forward. And their phrase in those early days was preferential options for the poor. That everything you did had to be based in the clear knowledge that when you were deciding what action to take, the choice you made had to make a preference for the poor. And that was really quite remarkable because we have many organizations that speak beautifully about caring for the poor, but what is your decision-making process? And that was wonderful to watch. And so I had the opportunity to visit Haiti with them. And at one point, Paul was speaking to a woman who was receiving treatment for TB disease. And he asked her what I think is the universally important question that we ask patients. What do you think caused your illness? And her response to him was the evil eye. And so he stopped and he asked her, well, if you believe it was the evil eye, then why do you take your medication? so consistently. And she just looked at him and she patted him on the arm and she, she said, oh, young man, you don't understand complexity. And that's really the issue, is that what people are faced with is enormously complex. And so really, why don't we talk about complexity? You know, what is it that causes us to shy away from the conversations about complexity that could take us so far down the line? And I'll offer you an example of something that you might recognize if you're engaged in healthcare. We can say we have a young man, um, you know, he comes to a clinic or he's been brought into care through the outreach because we're all trying to get out into community and bring people into care. And we realize that he would be eligible to services because we can classify him as homeless. And so he comes in, he hasn't accessed care in the US. Great, this is a new user. Another great category for healthcare very often. And he has arrived from Honduras, although he says he came from Mexico. So we're not quite sure the migration story because immigration holds a lot, not enormous amount actually, but a lot more perhaps acceptance for someone fleeing Honduras than someone who comes from Mexico. And so we see migrants making all sorts of choices to decide declaring where they're coming from. And the presumption we make is he's an economic migrant. He's come to improve his lot in life, to work differently. But this needed to be modified, and I had mod modified it in my slides. His concern is that he might have HIV. But when you look at someone and you make the presumption that they're coming for economic reasons, the place that you might not get to is that really he's a sexual migrant. And he's, he's engaged in some experiences in his own country where then he's left with questions about whether or not he's put himself at risk and this might actually be an accurate diagnosis. But where did he come from? How is it that we pay for our care to him? What does he qualify for? 
Where is he eligible? We don't have any medical records from before, so this is all fresh. How deeply do we go in, in evaluating his health? And then if he is here as an economic migrant, can we charge the inevitable sliding fee scale? And so there's all of these pieces that come into play very often with people of goodwill who are trying to provide health care. But what happens is then it results in a number of missed opportunities. Clinicians are not able to speak with one another because they're moving so fast. I mean, we hear from health centers that clinicians have a panel so large that they have from seven to 11 minutes to speak to a patient in their exam room, um, that they pass their colleague in the hall and there really is no opportunity to do a warm handoff or to have spoken to someone from eligibility to say this was a question that was raised. And so do we ask all of the right questions? Has this young man been evaluated for other STIs? Um, have we contemplated hepatitis C, which is actually so much more likely? I mean, are we doing a review of what is likeliest to make this young man sick in the next five years, as opposed to our population calculations of what it is that we're likely to see among Latinos? And then are we truly engaged in a conversation with the patient? about what he needs, what his concerns include, what it is that he would require from us that would really maybe be much simpler than what we're going to put him through when we do get him into the exam room. Because the, the, in our seven minutes, how much do we want to try and do? And because his eligibility means that he may not have a whole huge dollar amount to deal with, do we limit the care that we provide or do we go for the gold standard and then have to figure out later on what to do when that pot of money runs out before the end of the fiscal year? And so there are so many missed opportunities that people have to come up against because of the challenges to the decisions that they make. And it's everywhere. I mean, it's, it's not just what we face day to day in our work setting. It's what we are engaged in when we talk about funding. It's what's going on in our own homes. It's what we hear on the radio. And so it's, it's on a huge scale. There are so many points of intersection. Um, and, and really then, how do we tease them all out? And I think that what you get is what many of us experience, which is that we lower our head and we hope that whatever tsunami is approaching will pass over us and flow away and leave us standing so we, that we can go on marching through our work. Because if we grapple with every single thing that comes our way, then we are ineffective, the, fi the fatigue overtakes us, and we have what my friend says, which is that you should get a job in an industry that pays a lot of money and give all your money away. So I think it's really very hard for those of us who want to stay and really want to work hard to see our way clear through a path where we feel that we can be effective. And I think that that's really the critical piece. And very often we don't because it's challenging what's going on out there. And I think that we'd also have to be willing to look explicitly at our own beliefs and experiences. And what does that mean in how we um, interact with somebody? And if it's an emotionally charged topic, are we gonna be able to stand there and grapple with our own sort of individual sense of of discretion about whether or not you, you should talk to someone boldly and clearly about what's happening. Um, you know, I hear the expression conflict averse, and, and certainly, it con you know, conflict at all its levels makes people very uncomfortable. Even small conflicts about, you know, office materials, all the way up to larger conflicts about pay equity in the same organization that is trying to do the health equity work that we're describing. And the choices that get made for how people are able to move up the ranks and the, the way evaluation is conducted very often requires that we look at our own personal beliefs and experiences and then be willing to grapple with it. And when you look at, in healthcare, the, the piece that I always point to is I was doing an evaluation uh, of clinicians in their engagement in direct conversation, in emotionally charged conversation with their patients around STIs. And I'm standing in an exam room sort of partitioned off. I can see the clinician. I can't see the young man directly. And she is looking down at her clipboard. 
and she is ticking through everything that she needs to do. And she says to him, do you use condoms with every act of intercourse? That's how she phrases it. Do you use condoms with every act of intercourse? And he says, with women? And she never looks up and she says, yes. And he says, yes. And on we go to the next question. And I, I was a woman with her hair on fire. I didn't know what to do because at that point, I couldn't intervene. That was not my role. But we were going to let this man young out, walk out, possibly from the only encounter he would have in an STI clinic. And that answer was hanging in the air. So we would be confronted with trying to decide, do we intervene in, an, in a situation where we have not been explicitly included to try and course correct something that we see going on? And that's very hard to do. But as you know, we, we look out, I mean, we really need to understand that a lot of these values are unconscious. You know, that we walk through our lives believing ourselves to be good people, and I think that we truly are, by and large, good people, and want to do right by the folks that we purport to help and with whom we are engaged. But we also have at our core those unknown values, those unconscious values that can come out at, in very unexpected moments. Um, and, and what is it that we do with that? But as we look at the world, and as we understand that globalization is going to increase the occasions when we need to interact with somebody very different than ourselves, that we see we are no longer going to really have the ability to set some of those things aside and narrow our focus and channel our efforts only in the area where we feel comfortable. Really, as the world becomes one place, we're going to have to think about how we interact with people different than ourselves, the other of us, and really grapple with the emotions that rise up, our sentiment around what that means, and then what it is that we might need to do for ourselves. Because I think this is the reality. I think, you know, 244 million international migrants last year, and that's up from 2013 when it was 232 million. So the world is just moving. And, and if it, just in our own room, how many of you moved for school? How many of you moved for a job? How many of you moved in the military? How many of you moved because your parents were in the military? How many moved because economically where you were living was no longer viable and you needed to go elsewhere? I mean, there are so many categories that move people away. And yet, if we reflect on ourselves, we don't term ourselves migrants. We want to categorize that as the other. But the causes of, of movement of humans is millennial old. And at the core of health is the migration of human beings and the movement of those illnesses from one location to another. So we need to stop seeing migration as an aberration as something that kind of only happens elsewhere, and really understand that it is the casual or the extreme movement of humans that we need to be concerned with, and that that movement can really have a significant effect on health and the health of our communities. And I think it's really true as communities start to change. I know that in northern Colorado, for decades, Latino migrants engaged in agriculture was the huge reality. And yet, as, as time has gone on, I know that there's been a challenge by the introduction of Somali migrants, who then were able to engage in agriculture because they had come from a part of the world where they'd been involved in agriculture, but they came with a green card. And they came with access to Medicaid. And it made it much safer for many of those communities to then turn to that population for their workforce and eliminate the workforce that had been there historically for decades. And so when we start talking about culture, then we really need to think about the broader piece of how we articulate culture, the culture of agriculture, the culture of farm workers, the culture of migrants, because we can hold one definition and have held it for decades and realize in a heartbeat that it's no longer true. And yet we're not incorrect in believing that we need to focus there, but that how it needs to look will really change. And so when we talk about migration, 
I think this is the piece, this is the place where I find myself most focused and where I think most of us can be putting our energy. It is with the ability to drive down vulnerabilities and increase opportunities. That it has to be a measure of both. If we can look at those places where the people for whom we are concerned are challenged with a vulnerability and also look at a place where there might be opportunities for them to better their position and feel stronger in their orientation of, of taking care of themselves that we do a great deal. But this is one of the places that I think we struggle the most. So much of our health care is provided through um, funding from governmental organizations. And I think if you look at the national level, that the same government that's trying to encourage us to bring people into care and make sure that they utilize the services are the same government that has immigration policies that seeks to find people, incarcerate them, and return them to their country. We find ourselves in a very difficult place of trying to speak to individuals and help them understand the nuance of what that might mean in their own lives. We want them to step out of the shadows and take advantage of health care, but we really know that by stepping out of that shadow, they can put themselves at enormous risk. And so that's a very difficult thing, I think, for us to negotiate. But as we're doing that, I want to offer you just a couple of examples so that you see also at the personal level and not just at the large level when we talk about the intersection of poverty and health. And this is the case of a man that we worked with in the, in the uh, Health Network project that, that Ned was talking about earlier. And he came from Guatemala and was diagnosed with pulmonary TB. Young man, but who knows what the source case had been. He now needs to move around because there is no money without work. And so if there's no work where he is, he cannot stay. But if we know that his treatment is at least going to take six months, but if there's any kind of break, it extends it, then we need to follow him from place to place. And so he kept calling and saying, nope, can't stay in New Jersey. I need to go south. So then we'd call Florida and he'd be like, oh, I'm not going to stay in Florida any longer because the work there really didn't pan out. Now I'm going to go to North Dakota. And then we'd call North Dakota, oh, I'm not going to stay there any longer. I'm going to go back and do Christmas trees in North Carolina. Because what forces him is the need to be able to provide for his family. And that's economic, and that's based on the availability of work. But the only way we make sure that he doesn't die from a fully treatable, curable disease is to make sure that we keep track of him. And so that is where we, through Migrant Clinicians Network, have begun to see our work, is if we can reduce his vulnerability to illness, which is curable, but by providing him with the opportunity to access that care, regardless of where we go, he goes, then we know we've done a good job for him. And another example would be the young woman who's 18 years old. And it's always very interesting for me to talk about pregnancy and the need for prenatal care in terms of health care. Because by and large, women who are pregnant do not think they're sick. They're just pregnant. And so they're trying to move on with their lives and, and get the kind of care that they need. Um, and so it, we, we worked with this young woman, and she had to move because she neither drove nor was in charge of the housing nor had the money to take care of herself. So if she didn't leave with the group that was going to provide her transportation, she was going to be stranded, there wasn't work anywhere, and she was going to lose her living circumstances. And so what we did was then allowed her to move and made sure that she caught up. We had an example of a woman who was going to leave Michigan for Florida at 39 weeks of pregnancy. And I had a moment, I, I must honestly admit, where I said, can't you stay? And I no sooner had those words out of my mouth than I thought, well, of course she can't stay. If she could, she would. But she wasn't going to have housing. There was no more work. There was work waiting for her in Florida. There were people who would let her live. And there was someone who was willing to drive her and make her one of their passengers. So at 39 weeks, we sent her medical records to Florida. We found an OB that was willing to take her at that point, And she delivered a healthy baby. But what it took to convince someone that she was not a high-risk pregnancy because we could document her, her care throughout the entire period of her pregnancy was really pretty remarkable. 
and it took the good faith of a clinician that was willing to work with us. So these are the cases that we see daily where it really is that intersection of the need to migrate, to keep away, to keep poverty at bay, and the effect that it has on their health can really be quite enormous. But the place where I find myself almost wholly unsuccessful, and I wish I understood better, and this is something that I would love to learn from you and other colleagues, is to truly how we can address stigma. Stigma of individuals coming into communities to do important work, to perhaps do work that no one else wants to do, that's essential for what goes on, that keeps them from coming forward and requesting services that are not unreasonable, and really not even services that they're not going to pay for, that they are going to be willing to step forward and, and pay what they can and, and see that they are, are compliant with what's being requested of them. But the stigma that's, that's out in our communities now, for me and in my perspective, is only increasing. And this is the one place where I find myself losing ground. Um, and, and I'm not quite sure what the answer is. Um, so I, I would love during our, our discussion to hear more from you about what you see going on in your communities. And this is another example um, of a case where it was her own sense of feeling stigmatized and the stigma that she was experiencing as she sought care. It was a woman who was enrolled in the Southern site, again, for prenatal care, um, <coughs> older than average in her late 30s for, for uh, prenatal care. And she stated early on when we enrolled her that she really wasn't eating well, um, that she wasn't taking very good care of herself, but that she needed to move. And so we were able to get her into care further north. And when she showed up there, then we started getting calls. Your patient is missing her appointments. She is being non-compliant. And so we really tried to engage with her and understand what was going on. We have a wonderful caseworker who was calling her regularly and asking what was going on. And the woman declared feeling numb and sad and being unable to continue. And finally, over time, even as she kept moving, and our young worker got her in to see a therapist, what we finally discovered was this trauma that's referred to in the second panel. She had left a 14-year-old daughter in a Central American country, and the young woman committed suicide by drinking pesticides. So here's a woman, newly pregnant, bringing another life into the world, having to witness that a life she left behind ended when she was not there to attend to it and perhaps intervene. And so now we have someone who doesn't want to stay pregnant, who doesn't even really in many cases want to stay alive. But we brought her in, she was able to get some counseling, and eventually the woman declared that she really didn't see that the, that the therapist was doing her any good anymore, and so she didn't want to see her. But how wonderful that she stayed in care. And it, she was due in February. We did receive word that she had a normal delivery, but then we lost her, and we never heard from her again. And so we don't know what the end result is for this particular woman. But along the line, and I really want to credit the young woman from our staff who worked with her, to really at least get her to a point of a normal, healthy delivery. Because I have to be honest and say, my colleagues along the way wanted to find fault with her and her behavior without really truly understanding her motivation. So when we look at vulnerabilities for workers, it's you know so many things that we talk about. It's language, culture, dangerous work, immigration, lack of regulatory pr protections, healthcare access, a number of items that keep coming up over and over and over again. And I think that we really do then need to pick the occasions where we can try and have some effect. And so I have colleagues that are looking at dangerous work. They look at the lack of regu regulatory protections. Um, we make small inroads. We've just now been very successful in challenging the EPA to translate the labels on pesticides into Spanish. Now, you would not think that that would be such an enormous improvement or that it would take so much, but that was a 10-year battle. And that one regulatory piece took a lot of energy. 
And so, uh, you know, we, we go through, um, you know, trying to see is there a way to do uh, an intervention for workers that are in danger. And you'll call a state and they'll say, well, for a state of millions of people, there are three regulators. And they might get to you once every two years. And they might find a fault with how a, you know, a company is, is protecting their workers. And they might cite them. But the organization really doesn't pay the fine. And then you have to take them to court to make that challenge stick. And it's this sort of cyclical event that very often um, anyone who is really not working to the best interests of workers can sort of challenge it by not moving and dragging their feet long enough that very little goes on. And then everything is, you know, and immigration uh, it changes and, it, and it, uh, it becomes a federal issue that can have state and local implications as well as access and use of funds. So these vulnerabilities, no matter how long we've been working on them, continue to remain in place, and then continue to reemerge as the populations change. And so what I ask individuals to do then is to think about examples where they might be experiencing some of this um, and, and reflect on what that experience is really saying to them. If you've worked with someone and you start to feel impatience rise or you're annoyed, you know, you've, you're engaged with someone, and it, the, the moment may be that they're not just trying to be obstreperous and not listen to what you're saying. Is that really they're feeling concerned or confused, and what, when your annoyance rises because you're in a hurry, then perhaps it requires that we reflect on ourselves. Or if personal questions get asked and it reflects to your perception, sort of a, a cultural need that they're being a little bit um, offensive and a little bit invasive. And really what's being expressed is just a need to say, I need to trust you. Tell me a little bit more so that I feel confident about what you're saying to me. Or if they repeat your instructions verbatim, it could be that they really did not understand what you're saying. And they're hoping that by just repeating the words, it will somehow make a little bit more sense. And so perhaps rephrasing. Um, and then hesitation. And a hesitation when, when you offer a point and nothing comes back, you may have hit a kind of wall. I think we just need to, to take a second look at those moments. And this, for me, is the new golden rule. I'm not asking that you treat other people the way you want to be treated. I'm asking you to take a moment to truly learn to treat people the way they want to be treated because it can be very, very different. So to just you know, highlight what many of you probably already know, but is the motivation for my work and really reminds me why, is that I think every single day we need to realize that two Latino workers die, that one in four construction workers are Latino, and that that is one of the most dangerous industries in the country. And so our representation, both in that workforce and in the mortality rate, is enormous. And so in every group, then, we, we can look at agriculture is certainly very dangerous, large penned animals, construction, being out in the field, gardening, all of these elements really do require, then, that we look around us and see where there is danger to workers that we might be able to respond to. And these are just um, examples from the newspaper in 2015 and early 2016 of individuals, a man who was struck by a truck while he was mowing grass on a highway, or a young man that drowned in, in a waste pool at a location, or another young man who was working in construction and a, and a marble slab fell on him. I mean, the, the variety of dangers that workers confront are huge. And the safety of those sites really is not well monitored because there are not enough inspectors to go out there and look at that. And so allying ourselves with individuals who are trying to take a hard look at worker safety, I think, is one of the places where we can do a lot for health. And so this is a, 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 a patient stroll through a health center. Um, and I tried to do this from the perspective of what the patient sees. And the patient walks in, and the, maybe the first person they see is at the front desk. And this was an amazing occurrence to me. I went to a health center in Georgia, 
and I was doing some training on family planning for Latinas and how it is that we might reach out to them and really make it a more exceptional and acceptable service. And I had a woman raise her hand and say to me, I want you to know that in my memory, those services were not available to me and my family. And now you're asking me to extend myself to someone else who might not even be here legally. You need to understand how difficult that is. And I stopped. Because the person greeting you comes to their job with their own history and their own experience. The person arriving may not understand. And it's certainly not that we can ask the patient to understand, but we should work with our staff. Because we also have the experience, and this was at a different health center, where I spoke to some eligibility workers. And what they said to me was, you know, no one in my family ever took um, you know, uh, a benefit. My family didn't need to take a benefit as a point of pride, which I want to support absolutely. If you were proud of your family, you deserve to be proud of your family, that you see the need and the use of benefits as a negative for the people that you are assessing. That's a critical challenge. And then we have members of our healthcare team who don't see themselves as a member of the healthcare team. They see themselves as a cog in the wheel often. And they're just working along, trying to get through the volume of work that's required of them in a day. And yet they can be critically positioned in a place that can deeply affect our patients. So I was doing a hepatitis C project, and I was talking to a lot of lab workers, and, and they were so fixated on making sure that the barcode matched the name, matched the barcode on the wrist, matched what was, they were trying to con con uh, conclude from the test. And so they were you know, not looking at the patient in the eye, and the patient was you know, sort of asked to be there so that they could give blood without any explanation of the process, of what it meant, of any quelling of their fears. And that was a very interesting piece for me to observe. And then something as, um, you know, as, as um, simple as the medical assistant um, speaking the same language, but idiomatically having some places where they don't match, using some terms that are not good, truly not being fully competent in that language, um, and then being asked, being tasked to report what the patient is saying to someone who's going, then going to be making healthcare decisions. Um, and so that was a difficult piece to look at as well. And then finally, we have uh, the clinician who's going to try very hard. I think if you ask the clinician, do you want to give your patient the best health care possible, the answer would be yes. And if you ask the patient, do you want to get the best health care you can, they would say yes. Does it mean the same thing? Not always, and really frequently, no, not the same. So it's that whole understanding of what it is best for your patient and listening to the patient about what they feel is the problem and what, they, what it is that they could use. And if you've never read, and it's an old book now, The Spirit Catches You and You Fall Down, I really recommend that you go back to it. Because in the face of trying to provide good care, we're also looking at different care structures and pay structures, and we're trying to do the systems part of it and the mechanics of it as we're trying to do the human engagement part of it and, and the real addressing about what our communities might need and being receptive to changes and understanding all of the elements. And I think it's at that juncture that we're asking people to juggle a great deal. And how it is that you decide the right course of action to take, I think, is really difficult. And right now, my particular irritation is that while we want, while I am certainly encouraged at the Affordable Care Act and that it has done so much to bring so many people into care who were not in care before, it explicitly excluded undocumented migrants. And so for me, it was very difficult to do the great hallelujah and feel like we were moving forward if what we want to do is guarantee advances on the backs of people who deeply need that resource. So what's our course of action? And I think the very practical piece of it is that we need to really think long and hard about what we can do organizationally. 
and individually. And that, that we want to look at both what's going on internally and with our partners in the community. And so it means that we really need to have a divine set of values, policies, and practices that we articulate with one another and that we agree on and that we revisit. Once stated is not solid. Once stated is just once stated, and they must be reiterated. And we have to build that capacity to gain cultural knowledge and values and, and understand the strength and the diversity. And I offer this as a simple example. I've been doing this a million years now. And I've been in settings where somebody says, Latinos are um, fatalistic. <laughs> and I say, OK, well, if you're poor, and you live in rural Mexico, and you're diagnosed with stage four cancer, and there's no money for transportation, and you don't live near enough to services, and you say out loud, I am going to die from my cancer, is that you being fatalistic or pragmatic? And it's pragmatism. So I ask us all to look at the values in the culture and really understand. And trying to navigate those differences is really, it can be very difficult, absolutely. And so we need to challenge one another, but we also need to support one another because it is a hard row. And then we need to look at our own organizations and our own interactions for the biases that, that are you know, sort of propagated and remain in place. Because we are an organization committed to doing good doesn't mean that everything we do internally is good. And so we need to take a hard and fast look at our organizations so that we're going to value diversity, look at some self-assessment that is ongoing, and that we look at those dynamic differences and not try and quell them and make everybody the same, but that really the institution understands that there are cultural differences and that they're present in our organizations and present in our communities. And we really want to address the imbalance of power. And that means inside our own organizations as well as outside in our communities. And I see this in health centers right now that are putting a lot of pressure on community health workers to be out there and to be the voice of the health center and the messenger for health services and the, the group that's recruiting patients into care, and yet they have no power on the clinical team, no champion in the clinical setting, and no way to change the culture and the environment of the health center. So I really ask us to look at those pieces. And then personally, I ask us all to be present and take risks and lower your defenses. Um, because it really, if we can be flexible, if we can look at an altered, you know, sort of alternative perspectives and really think that no matter how old we are, and I have a friend who says to me, you're as old as dirt, okay, we're not too old to learn. And if we can just give ourselves those opportunities and welcome them and know that it may be difficult, but we really can do a great job. And I always like to leave people with at least one instrument, one tool that I think can make our work better. Um, and this is specifically for healthcare. We can do it also in other settings. But where we take a long-standing practice, the clinical history, the medical history, and we look at deepening it and getting more information that can give us a, a better understanding of the person that's in front of us. So that when we talk about do you have, you know, do you live in an apartment, a house, a trailer, or with other people? And we just get the answer of, yes, I live in an apartment. But we don't follow it up with, is that really where you sleep? Do you feel safe there? Are you sharing that space with other people who are engaged in using drugs, in selling drugs, so that you then feel like you are, you are challenged? And going all the way down to this area at the bottom about presumed worthiness. Ask the person if they consider themselves to be someone who deserves good care and who understands that you want them to have that care and that you all are in alliance with one another. And so it's, um, it's one of the last slides in your packet. You have some of the work that I've drawn from there as articles. Um, you have one of the very early articles from Paul Farmer when he talks about people like ourselves who want to be out there championing good are often the prophets and prophetic voices are not always well received. There's an article there about deservingness and how people make decisions about who deserves what and who doesn't. And I really recommend them all to you. 
and hope that you and I can engage in conversation both here and further in time. Thank you so much. Well, that was terrific, Delinia. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to ask uh, for questions from the group. And um, just a couple comments. The, the microphones, there's one here and one here. And so, well, you'll have to move to the microphones. I want to make sure that our Spanish speakers feel comfortable in asking a question. Our interpreters will interpret it for, for me, anyway. And um, uh, this, so everyone should have the opportunity. Um, I might get started uh, with a question then. So a lot of your work with the Migrant Clinicians Network looks at ending health disparities or providing health care. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about an example in another state or a different locale where you've had a success in that area. And you know, what did it take? What were the elements that led to the success? And, and I guess I offer the individual cases that we went through in the presentations as some of our examples of success. And I think what it has really meant is that we've understood the systems that were in place. We asked the patient specifically what it is that they wanted. We sought those specific steps and replied in a way that then the person could say to us, this is what I want to see happen versus this is what we believe you should see done. So we've done this with tuberculosis. We now, through our system, which we've been doing for 20 years now, have followed mm, close to, we've had about 8,000 patients come through the system, but we've followed about 500 cases of active TB to 111 countries, from the US to 111 other countries. And I can say to you that treatment completion has been guaranteed for 84% of those cases. And so if you look at what the CC is, CDC is able to do in the US, it's about 87% for people who stay in their community and receive treatment. And we're able to do that for people who are moving around the globe. So it's understanding your systems, seeing good partners, making sure that you understand the steps that are there, and engaging with the patient to make sure that they are getting what they want. I was thinking about TB and HIV and a little bit about pregnancy. <laughs> uh, and I was thinking about, there, there are, so it, this isn't supposed to be a cynical question. Okay. Fair enough? Fair enough. There's a little bit of an additional sense of urgency, especially around <laughs> infectious diseases, that I think help garner interest and in resources. And I wonder if there are examples around other conditions that don't have that um, uh, transmissibility, such as an abnormal pap smear, mm -hmm. and, and, and taking the same uh, person who's moving from state to state, who we in our, in our infinite knowledge have provided a life-saving screening, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the actual condition is more a risk to the person herself, uh, and so there isn't that sense of we need to protect right. other people. Right. So can it, are there any differences in addressing chronic diseases or diseases that don't have that kind of sense of risk to others? I think there is and then there isn't. I think that we started our work with TB because it was our position that mobility and migration should never be an impediment to health. And the way we wanted to prove that was to show you that we could take someone with a condition that required treatment and see it through to the end successfully. Now, we didn't have any money to do it. TB had a public mandate. That, that treatment is free of charge. And so that's why we started there. But as soon as we did that, somebody said, oh, well, that's because TB is you know, a public health mandate. So then we started working with cancer because we wanted to say, here was someone with an urgent need of their own where healthcare is not guaranteed and the end result could be the same. They could die in the same way that someone dies from TB. And so we did, and we showed that you could do that. And then they said, well, what if it's not as urgent as cancer? So then we added diabetes to say we could show chronic disease that requires a lifetime of management. So yes, the urgency of something being communicable, 
makes the community and the public health community a little bit more responsive. But our work has always been to say the end point is the same for us. Migration should never impede health, and we can show you that that can be the case. You can move around and we can make sure that you can get into care. And if we work in partnership, we can keep you as healthy as possible. And so that's what we've been doing. Great. Thank you. Question here? Yes, uh, Reverend Dr. Ann Rice Jones, uh, Together Colorado, Greater Metro Denver Ministerial Alliance. We here in Colorado have a, an initiative as a ballot issue, uh, Colorado Care, that is one of the first single payer universal health concept. Can you share with us the potential for us ever really getting that in place? And are there other places looking at it? And I know it has to have value because the Koch brothers are fighting it and people are looking at the propaganda and accepting it. But tell us even a bit about universal, how that really would help us all. And, and I think it's, it's a long way off in this country because um, payment for healthcare services is such a big business. And so that makes it a real challenge. And I think because so many healthcare services, healthcare delivery systems are independent businesses, that that makes it a challenge as well. But I think that as the world becomes more globalized and you have individuals coming to this country from other parts of the world where they do have nationalized health service and single payer, and they are able to see the stark differences between what they've come from and what they're experiencing here, the greater and greater momentum is built around it. And that what it takes, as with so many things, is a single state uh, rising to the challenge, willing to buy in, demonstrating its effectiveness, offering other states the, the template of how they were able to make it work, that you then can build on it. But I would really be remiss if I didn't say that the challenge is fairly enormous. And the likelihood, and this is my pessimism, of seeing it in my lifetime is really pretty bleak. Well, thank you. Question here. Hi. Hi. This is on. Yes. Super. I'm Tracy Pohl. I work with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, and I specifically support the Title 10 Family Planning Program here in the region. And I was specifically interested in the imbalance of powers that you talked about towards the end, because that's something that we very commonly see when we go out and we do a review mm -hmm. at the health center level. And the idea behind this patient-centered approach where we really want to understand the whole patient and that empowerment at the level of the providers that are seeing it, but the leadership level, whether they're clinical or not within the health center, not understanding why it may take more than nine minutes or 11 minutes or 23 minutes to really understand why that's important. So I didn't know if you had any talking points or any experiences that, that really would lend itself to folks who are seeing those patients and leading up and bringing that back. Because ultimately we understand that it is a business and that there are financial repercussions for that extra four minutes that you're spending getting to know that patient. But the other end of the equation being if you take that four extra minutes, what that means for providing additional services for the patient that you might not need to do there in that protective that particular setting. Thanks. Thank you. It, and I think it's really interesting. Some of the places where I've seen it be successful, um, they've been able to couch that internal evaluation, the reassessment and the realignment of time and responsibility under a performance improvement strategy. Um, and that's the kind of language that seems to make people happy. So if you can couch it in terms of we're going to look at the investment of time and energy at all levels and recalibrate that energy and, and our commitment to seeing that this is important here and the effect to it is not going to be significant in the whole, it may just bump it a little bit, and that you do have greater patient satisfaction, greater patient adherence to the treatment protocols, greater um, uh, positive outcomes in your performance measures, that then it seems to lead to a willingness to observe that. So I would really ask you to read some of the literature right now on some of the performance improvements efforts that are underway, because I think it does a lot to advance the business part of it. Next, we're here. Hi, I'm, I'm here with uh, Voces Unidas for Justice, I'm based in Colorado Springs. And you touched on it briefly. Um, I particularly am a holistic counselor, mental uh -huh. health. Uh -huh. So I was wondering how much of that, it, I mean, you touched on it briefly with the therapist and, and having 
counseling you know, to people who are mobile. I once upon a time was a migrant farm worker myself for 15 years. And I, you know, there's a lot of need for that as well. And then the other part of the question is, with all the sexual abuse and domestic violence, needing the counseling going forward and the resources going forward, how much of that is tied into the counseling maybe with the connections of the network being migrant? Golly, it's enormous. I mean, the, you know, the connection is huge. When you think about how sexual violence has been used to maintain power, just starting right there. So it's at, in the person's home, it's in their migration process, it's in their work environment, it could be in their personal relationships. And so then the experience, the cumulative experience of violence, the person really never gets to post-traumatic stress because it's traumatic stress ongoing. And so the mechanism for coping is a strategy that is modified by the person all the way over the entire arc of their life. What's needed is, is absolutely for us to look at violence and sexual violence and the use of sexual violence very deeply and that those conversations need to be present at all levels. I think you're starting to see it more now with efforts in farm labor to say we're gonna hold managers and you know, field um, supervisors and farmers accountable. We're starting to see some wonderful being, work being done for individuals who are cleaning office buildings and who are alone and that those voices are coming forward. So I think a couple of things are happening. The magnitude of the issue is really starting to come to light and those lights are remaining hard focused on it. The voices of those affected are really coming forward and they're being amplified and they're being given a platform. And we're really starting to see how general it is across a lot of industries, particularly for women. But I do not want to discount men being affected by sexual violence as well. And I think the conversation needs to start really in terms of equity and relationships, in person to person relationships. And some of that education, I think, is now being done beautifully by groups that are, that are doing like men to boys, um, where they're really trying to say the balance of power can be viewed very differently, but it's all of a piece. So you have people experiencing it throughout their lives. You have people trying to affect it in all of these different ways by bringing you know, legal assistance to them and changing the law. And you have people trying to do education. But in the end, the piece that I see as really missing is mental health, is behavioral health, and access to it. Um, and that's one of the places where it's, it, you know, there's a stranglehold on what's available to people. I believe that that's one of the places where telehealth could do a great deal, um, particularly with non-English speakers, but the ability to be able to provide mental health services across state lines is still a line in the sand that does not seem to budge. So I think we're doing a lot of great work, but I think that that one piece in response is a place where we're really falling short. Thank you. Ulisa. Hola, Dialiana. Hola. My name is Julissa Soto, and I'm the director of the American Diabetes Association Latino Initiatives. I have been there for 11 years. I started um, three years ago doing some work in the south area of Colorado, Colorado Springs, Pueblo. And this is a question for you. I have faced, you know, discriminations, Latinos against Latinos, right? Specifically, when I visit the low-income clinics or the federal qualified low-income clinics, I have noticed that Latinos have some resentment when they're Latinos, but they don't speak the language. Therefore, they discriminate uh, with the new immigrants as myself, you know, and they hear the accent right, right away. They assume she's a new immigrant. She's not part of our community. Specifically, I'm talking Pueblo, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when I was visiting the clinic, the way, the way that um, Latinos were treating the new immigrant community was very different than the way that they were approaching the Latinos who have been here for fifth, sixth generations, right? And I did face them, right, and say, hey guys, I really think you guys discriminate in here. They looked at me and they're like, no, we're all Latinos in here, and I said, come on, come on. You, for how many years you have been here in existence and you don't provide any programs in Spanish for the community, for the new immigrant community that you have in the east side of Pueblo, right? Number one. Number two. 
you know, I just saw at the front desk, you know, a Latino speaking English to somebody that keeps saying, keep saying, no hablo inglés, no hablo inglés. How many times did that lady had to repeat the same phrase, right? And that hurt me and killed my heart because for me, being in the United States, I know people hear my accent, but for me, when we're Latinos, we're all Latinos, you know? It's like, hello, you know, if you see us and, and I don't speak, you will put me, you know, with all the Latino community, right? But then now, if you, know, you get to know my story, yes, I was born and raised in Michoacan, Mexico. Yeah, I will be with the new immigrant community side, right? Well, talking to these, um, to the Pueblo Community Health Center and, and everyone else, um, me bringing programs to them where my team operates here in Denver, but now I have migrated to Colorado Springs and Pueblo. That has been very challenging for me because then I'm labeled as the troublemaker just because I'm like, hey, the new immigrant community exists. Come on, guys. You, you tell me that you don't have no programs in Spanish here, and how long have you been in existence here? Colorado Springs, 30% of the population is Latino. Pueblo, when they looked at me and I say, you don't have programs in Spanish, specifically when it comes to CVD, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, you have the highest rates of diabetes, and therefore, you don't have a program in Spanish, right? But let so me stop you, you in that, okay? Let's okay. go there. So you see it, and you can view it. Yeah. And I think the challenge here is you can either challenge them that they haven't done it, or you can step in and say, you know what, I see this is missing, and I'm going to help you bring it. Because I think we can challenge and challenge and challenge. And I tell you what, I don't shy away from a good fight. Yeah. So please know that. But on the other side, I want to have an effect. And if I bring resources to the table, if I demonstrate that something can be brought to bear, then some of the defenses come down. But if it's always a challenge of you're not doing it and you should be doing it, then the defenses really have a very difficult time coming down. So I offer it to you as perhaps an alternative. I think you need to call people always. But then I think the next thing needs to be, but you know what? I can help you make that better. Certainly, and I'm starting the classes there. And I'm speaking in here very different than what I speak there, you know, and there I was a little bit more humble, you know, because I really wanted to get into that clinic. And I really wanna work with low income clinics and be part of their electronic medical records that when they think about diabetes, they click that button and they refer to us. Yes, <laughs> but in here I'm speaking differently because I feel we're all professionals here and you know, I'm, I'm in a different environment. I'm, I'm not in Pueblo. So I'm like, yes. So, um, you know, just I'm, to know that people in Pueblo may see this may, video. May hear me so, here, you know. right? And they'll be like, <laughs> we remember you, but hey, I, I'm like you. I'm not, afraid to, I'm not afraid to challenge. But, you know, I really would love to see the clinics working, like you were saying in your presentation, you know, understanding communities. And one of the things that will stay with me, and now from now on, I will use your words in my presentations. You know how everybody says, get you know treat others like you want to be treated but you say treat others like they want to be treated so now that's going to be my line i'm going to steal it from you thank you i think we have time for one last question um i kind of wanted to speak to what you talked about in the beginning of your presentation with the uh i guess having to answer to funders and donors and having your vision compromised um, versus the model of the Florida workers and how they were autonomous in saying that they wanted to maintain their vision and not ex um, necessarily accept um, federal dollars. I guess my question is, is um, the Florida workers, is this a new paradigm that we're finding as a new means by which we can operate autonomously without having to answer to donors, but at running the risk of not having as much resources? Or is this something that, I mean, each organization will have to, you know, kind of question for themselves. Like what do you value, like what do you see as the uh, pros and cons of each um, side of that coin? I think it's the decision that each group is gonna have to make for themselves, certainly. I think if you look at worker groups now, Immokalee you know, workers in Florida or the Workers Defense Fund out of Austin and Dallas, that they have committed themselves to helping workers have a voice and that the workers are gonna then decide how those organizations will function and the decision-making authority about from whom they will accept money and how they will then you know, disseminate the power internally to their organization. I think every organization can have that conversation and that we do very often get into a place of we know we're doing good work and so if we can just pursue some funding, we can keep doing the good work 
And that, I don't mean to say that that is bad mm -hmm. at all. I'm just saying that we need to do it fully conscious of the choices that we're making and the effect that it can have and that if there's ever a moment where we want to retrench and say, really, this is inconsistent with our values and our goals, that we take that position and understand, come what may, that it may not go the way we want it to. But I'm not trying to make a hard and fast rule that it's one or the other, mm -hmm. but only to say that there can be success and that mostly I see there being success when people are truly evaluating what the group is interested in, where there is parity in the, in the volume of the voices in the room and in the decision-making authority. Um, and then maybe as a follow-up question, um, is there maybe a case study or um, similar literature in regards to how the farm workers in Florida were able to accomplish what they did? Um, to, to your knowledge, anything that you would refer to the audience as a means to you know, Golly, resource? I've not read much about their work. My information about their work is having visited with them um, and having their success you know, put in popular press in terms of their legal challenges mm -hmm. and the outcomes. So no, it doesn't mean that it's not out there, it just means that I'm not familiar with it. Sorry. Thank you. So um, we need to wrap up, but I hope you'll all uh, join me in thanking Dell for uh, uh, coming to us today. Thank you for having me. It's important to see a room full of people around these important topics. We know that no foundation, including the Colorado Trust, has the ability or the resources to address health equity by itself. Uh, we partner with communities and the residents in communities in working towards solutions to advance health equity in our state. And I think your presence here is another part of that partnership. Uh, again, we'll post the presentation, the slides, and then a couple of weeks, the video uh, of the presentation will be available. I encourage you, if you, if you found interesting things to think about today, uh, that you sign up, you go on our website and find out about our future uh, Health Equity Learning Series events. The next one is uh, November 10th, and there'll be additional information on the website soon. Uh, again, please fill out the survey, the evaluation survey. We, we rely on it heavily in our planning for most parts of the event. And then I, I can't stop without recognizing the team effort that these events are. I want to thank my staff who were very integrally involved in all steps and then especially Maggie Frazier who took responsibility for most of the things that happened today and uh, they came off really very flawlessly, Maggie, thank you. So I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you.